G'day dear viewers, today on the Ross and Jono show we are continuing in the Shapira saga, how he uh, happened upon these 16 leather strips, what he did with them, uh, and how that, that whole thing progressed. And last week, we were talking about the interim years between Shapira putting the 16 leather strips in a Jerusalem yep. bank vault. Uh, he put them there for five years, uh, and then eventually in 1883, he ventured to Europe to show the world uh, this this treasure that he had. What happened in, in the middle? Well, um, last week we talked about the Siloam That's inscription right. um, and we went into some detail there. Uh, but if, Ross, I just want to jump back in okay. time uh, before these years. Let's go back to 1878, just to remind the viewers. In 1878, uh, Shapiro wrote to uh, Schlerman right. and said, hey, look look what I've got. Here's my new toy. It's a marvelous thing. And then Schlerman immediately wrote back and said, how dare you present anything to me um, that is contrary to our Bible and uh, don't like yeah. you anymore. And we, we discussed this. We went into detail as to why that might be. Of course, uh, confirmation bias is a big thing for, for fundamentalists and so on and so forth. But um, uh, it scared Shapira back into his shell and into the bank vaults. The document went. Right. Uh, you, you know, it may have, that, that reaction may have had something to do with the Moabitica. We talked about that some uh, episodes ago. But then, uh, as we discussed, uh, he read a book by Frederick Bleak, an introduction to the Old Testament. And as Shapira uh, says himself, oh, what a change came over my right. mind. Now, that was in a, uh, a letter to Hermann Strach, and that's primarily what we want to talk about today is that letter. But before we get there, before we get there, uh, I want to talk about Schroeder. Okay. All of these guys, <laughs> what is this, Schlutman, Strach, Schroeder, who are these? It's easy to get them confused. Absolutely. Who is this man, and how does he play an important role in emboldening uh, Moses Shapiro to write to Strach um, and, and I want to talk about that letter in detail. So let's talk about Schroeder uh, now, if we can. And this is, a, again, at the point um, of uh, being emboldened by Frederick Bleek's book to take, to retrieve uh, the document from the uh, bank vaults of the Jerusalem uh, yep. bank. Um, and then he he contacts this man. Let, Who is this man? What are his credentials? Why is it important? Excellent lead in. Let me, let me give you a couple of data points here. You've set us up perfectly for tonight's show. What, what we see is that around, Shapira tells us around Easter of 1883, off the back of reading Bleak's mm -hmm. book and becoming very convinced that, hey, wait a minute, I think we actually might have a very ancient and authentic document that is uh, uh, unexpectedly so, something which advances and proves that what some of the academics were thinking uh, about the organization and the origin of the Old Testament, particularly the law, that there's a connection between his mm. document and these. So a couple of things happen. Around Easter, he goes and pulls this document out, and one of the people, uh, there is a minister named Carl Reinecke, who is a Lutheran church of mm. the Redeemer of Jerusalem. He's a pastor there. He encourages Shapira, gives, and this guy's also a scholar, tells him, you really, I cannot believe, he is blown away that Shapira's had this manuscript locked away in a bank vault. Just so happens that one of the Bergheim brothers, one of the Bergheim brothers, very influential in old city Jerusalem at the time, he hears that a, a very reputable scholar by the name of Professor Paul Schroeder uh, is in town, is in Jerusalem. So he coordinates a mm -hmm. meeting with Paul Schroeder, uh, who is also, by the way, at the time uh, in Syria, serving as the German consul of Beirut. Now, Schroeder is known because of his expertise, Jono, in uh, Phoenician script. In fact, he, he actually wrote right. a very, very famous, even to this day it's known, it's called Die Phoenicians Sprach, forgive my German, uh, but it's the Phoenician language. 
And it, 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 this book mm-hmm. was written, published in 1869, and it's a grammar book on ancient Phoenician based on all that academics knew at the time in 1869. So he sees the manuscript. So this is quite timely. Obviously, he's the he's the specialist. He is the guy, and this is, as I mentioned, quite timely. Uh, and and what you're telling me is that the uh, one of the, the the managers of the bank hosts him and Shapira for dinner. That, is this, is this that's correct? That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. He he invites him over, and Brilliant. it's in his home in May of 1883 that Shapira meets oh. uh, Professor Paul Schroeder. Now, let me give you a little side point here, because uh, one of the things that we picked up in the research, and and by the way, Dr. James Tabor is really, really focused on this piece of the research. I'll tell you, about Schroeder, what we know is that according to Miriam Harry, who wrote Little Daughter of Jerusalem, Mm. she reports that who we think, remember, she changes all the names in her story. But she talks about this brilliant mm-hmm. professor and uh, from Germany who befriends Shapira after he believes that the manuscript is real, and and we think and we have other evidence that uh, that puts forward this same theory that Schroeder's son falls in love with Augusta, the other daughter of Shapira. And Shapira and Augusta and this other family, the Schroeders, go on a European vacation together. So they're very, very close, and Schroeder is convinced that the manuscript is authentic. Now, listen, let me go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Wait, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but, but, but just on that, can I just confirm? Because you, yeah. you mentioned this, and I just wanted to confirm. Is this meeting uh, at the bank manager's? Uh, house yep. is this the first time he has met Shro- it is yeah okay all right so this is the first yep. okay, and go ahead. so uh, by the way it's Samuel Bergheim who arranges the meeting now remember this is it's not been mm. long that Shapira has pulled this manuscript out of the bank Bergheim bank vault and and he has already begun mm. to work for a series by the way we know according to Shapira's notes uh, that he worked four to five weeks producing uh, a, a workable transcription. Now, he's trying to figure this out. Remember, these are individual pieces, uh, and, and we'll talk about more of the physical characteristics and how many strips there are. We know that there are 16 leather strips mm-hmm. of varying lengths because they have different number of columns of text. But at Samuel Bergheim's, he shows Schroeder uh, this manuscript, the strips, and, and in the letter to Strzok, mm. which we're going to talk about, can I just read the little, he, he has an NB, you know, the Latin phrase, note bene, it means pay attention. He mm-hmm. puts this in the note to Strzok as he's closing. And here's what he says, NB, Professor or Dr. Schroeder, who is now German general consul at Beirut, is now here and has seen a few strips and thinks that the manuscript is unquestionable, a genuine. Now, I'm reading exactly what Shapiro wrote. His chief proofs are the beautiful Phoenician writing, as well as the pure grammatical Hebrew and the outward look of it, and the old linen found in some pieces in the back, M.W. Shapiro. So he at least reports... Hmm. He reports that Schroeder, who is a Phoenician expert, not only is he the German expert. consul uh, in, in Beirut, uh, and he's there on a visit, but he's also the specialist in ancient Phoenician. He looks at this and he said, this is unquestionably genuine. So he is doubly emboldened, uh, emboldened by uh, Bleak's book, uh, as to the authenticity of the document, but uh, now emboldened by Schroeder uh, in his professional yep. opinion. And with that, he feels that he has the right, um, the scholarly right, if, if I may say, to, the, the right to knock on the door of the ivory tower and speak to Strzok to, to find some sort of further endorsement. That's, is that what he's right. seeking? That's right. And so he sits down. And by the way, we know that he's in the process of writing the letter to Strzok when he meets with uh, Dr. Schroeder. And because it's pinned at the end of the letter in B, 
pay attention here. This is he wants it's he's about to lick the stamp basically, and he just says, "Oh, by the way, right, right. Schroeder is here." Schroeder says that it's authentic as well. Uh, love M. W. Shapira ships it off now. This letter makes its way towards Berlin because Strock is a professor there in Berlin, and I just wanted to say that uh, what we know is that Shapira makes a stop before he goes to Berlin. We'll talk about that. But ultimately, we also know, now we know, that Strock gets the letter. And and uh, with that, I'm going to tell at the end of the show something very special that was in the letter, and no one knows about this. Uh yeah. Right. Now, just just on that, yeah. if I may, um, we are, of course, for, for people who are just tuning in, uh, we're going through the Shapira saga. We're doing so um, fairly systematically through our textbook right. here, uh, The Moses Scroll, written by your fine self. Um, once again, available paperback, hardcover, and Kindle, and That's audio right. book now, if you prefer. Um, and what we're doing in this series is not just addressing the saga as it appears here, uh, but adding into that all the information that you have come into since uh, writing the book, and and now the book, how when when did the book come out? Just remind uh, us. In actually, we're coming up on the anniversary. It was March of 2021 when the book uh, actually went out mm-hmm. in the paperback. So, yeah, yeah. So there's there's further information, and this and what you're about to uh, reveal to us is is one such case. So go yeah, ahead. Yeah. So again. Schroeder is a key in this, and as I mentioned, Dr. Tabor is really onto this detail, and he's he's been he has been since the beginning. So so here's what happens: as you said, he's he's encouraged, he he's really lifted up by the fact that he he has someone uh, of this level of scholarship who says, "Hey, that's authentic," he, and he wouldn't have written this mm. in a letter to Strock if it wasn't true. See. So, in other words, because this stuff is going to be checked, what we now know, this letter was dated the 9th of May, 1883, and what I found in my research is that on the 27th of May, uh, Strzok writes a response to Shapira, and he says, don't even, I'm paraphrasing, but this is pretty close, don't even bother bringing such an obvious forgery to Germany. Don't, don't even bother. And and so, but Shapira doesn't get that letter. He is in route. In fact, once Shapira leaves, oh, oh, really? He doesn't receive. No, he doesn't receive the no, response. No, he doesn't receive. Uh, and even though the response is really quite, it's quick, isn't it? I mean, good heavens for for that year, yeah. even for uh, a letter to to leave Israel uh, uh, to Europe and back yeah. uh, like that. But he's already he's gone. already left. That's interesting. In fact, I didn't know that. So what you're saying is that this. Yeah. This wet blanket didn't didn't affect him. No, it didn't him. affect ahead. him. In fact, uh, Jonah, I want the the viewers to know that this is the last time Shapira will be in Jerusalem. So when once he leaves to go to Europe, that's it. He never comes back. Yeah, so true. he he mm. goes to Germany, and we're going to talk about the letter uh, because I don't want to get into mm. what happens once he gets to Germany. That's later. Let's look at the contents of this letter. And by the way, in the description of this video, I want people to know that I've published a transcription of this letter. And and what's so interesting is uh, I wanted it to be as authentic as possible. So it's on my academia page, but every misspelling and people might jeer and you know look at Shapira and say, "Oh, look, he misspelled these words." understand that he is multilingual. Uh, he is very, very smart. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not like he's, he's, he's right. writing words phonetically as they sound in English, but that's the way I represented it in this transcription. So two things. I just want to, before you read this yep. letter, I want to, uh, and we pick it apart, I just want to read something that you wrote. I really like this sentence uh, on page 33. Aside from the financial gains, Shapira, Shapira felt his work would earn him a place in the ranks of the learned, uh, validating once and for all his erudition in Semitic yeah. studies. Um, this is above all else. He longs for appreciation, and respect from the academic world. This is what he's trying to achieve. Uh, and the other question that I have: once we um, 
uh, finish unpacking this letter, why why the quick response? That it must be motivated, uh, a sharp, quick uh, response, a wet blanket. You know, hoping that hoping he's about to extinguish this whole thing. He wants nothing to do with it. I'm interested in the answer to that question. You, if you you talking about one. from okay, Strzok? You letter. mean Strzok's response? Yeah. From, so from Strzok, Strzok is part right. of a yeah. little club, and and the little club is remember Delich and Schlotman are members of the, Mm -hmm. hey, let's evangelize the Jews. There's actually an organization, and these are two of the founding members. Well, interestingly enough, Strzok is also part of this. Now, all three of these are clearly Mm. connected. They're friends, they're colleagues, they're workmates, and and there is a very uh, resistant movement almost, if you will, in Germany, as we're going to find out, Towards Shapira, remember, it's not been too, too long ago that this whole Moabitica affair took place. So they, it's, it, in fact, one scholar, what George Ebers later writes is that Schlotman is like a child burned. You know, it's like if you if you have a child and God forbid they touch a stove and you're oh. Like, yeah. oh. So they think Shapira is is like dangerous. So so there's the word is mm. out on the street. Hey, Shapira's got here comes Shapira with his bag of tricks. Now he's saying he's got this ancient manuscript. And what he tells Strzok in this letter, if he's right, now, in other words, they don't believe he's right, but if he is right, he's got the oldest biblical manuscript ever. We're gonna talk about that. But but see, these German scholars are very, very nervous about. Shapira. So here we go. He writes the letter, the 9th of May, 1883. This is a 10-page letter. It is found in uh, ADD uh, MS 41294. This is a document, a collection, a um, sort of a collection of documents that are found in the British Museum, uh, the British Library at the time, Mm -hmm. uh, British Library now, British Museum at the time, that contain all of these different mm-hmm. articles and, and different things. This letter, we're going to get into in another cl- another discussion. How is a letter from a German scholar, how did it end up in Ginsburg possession and ultimately find its way into this collection uh, in England? But that's that's a whole other question. Mm-hmm. All right. That's curious. So 9th of May. Okay. He begins, and I'll quickly go through some of this because some of our previous discussions have covered the details of this, but here's one of the things that we need to know is that this particular document, uh, when he writes the letter, what he does is uh, he starts off by telling Strzok, hey, uh, sorry to hear about your father. So evidently, you know, he, he's doing a cordial, here's what we now know, sorry, uh, to hear about that, and I know that you're busy with all of this high scholarship that you're working on, but here's what I want to start us with. Listen to how he, after he gets the formalities out of the way, here's what he says. I'm going to surprise you with a notice and a short description of a curious manuscript written in old Hebrew or Phoenician letters upon small strips of embalmed leather and seems to be a short, unorthodoxical book of the last speech of Moses in the plain of Moab, okay? So that's how he describes Mm. it. Now, let's work through this and and go through sort of quickly what what we have in this 10-page letter. We've already covered the story of the finding. What he wants to do is he wants to tell, uh, he wants to tell, the Professor Strzok, here's how I got it. Here's how it came into my possession, which he does. And he describes in detail, beginning on the at the end of page one, going into page two, it's found in a cave. It's high up in the Wadi Mujib. Uh, remember, we went through this a couple of times ago. He knows the place. He says, I know this place well. I went there with Professor Ompfist of Uppsala, uh, in 1875, mm-hmm. we're searching for details about this actual uh, journey at this point. But one of the things that he remembers, he as he hears the story about where it was located, he and he says, I love this, he says, I know the place well, listen to this, 
Omphist in the year 1875, and having seen that it is an old burial place, perhaps of some Egyptians settled there, and having found there some small piece, which seems to us to be of embalmed bodies, and we marveled of the dryness of the place. The Arab told us, this is his guide evidently, that no rain hmm. are able to approach this place as the north-south high rock sheltered it from rain. So he, he is imagining as he hears the stories from the Bedouin where this was found. He's like, I, I know that place. I know it well. It's so protected that the rain can't get to it. He acts like he knows the very cave. So when we went to Jordan looking for this cave, we had certain clues that helped us at least narrow that window down. Uh, now, what I'd like to do, I'll give you a chance to jump in and ask anything you want to ask, Jonah, but what I want to get to is when on page three in this letter to Strzok, how he describes his work mm -hmm. on the manuscript. You know, he, and he talks about the physical yeah. characteristics of it. All right? Mm, go ahead. All right, so here he goes. <clears throat> he says, I soon began to study the manuscript and found it a very heavy task for my eyes. The blackness of the leather, which mm. may have been caused by the penetration of the asphalt and most probably made worst by oil, which seemed the last owner oiled them to make them smooth, the decaying away of the ink and leather, which seems to be done by some insects or saltpeter, which are to be found in abundance on these nooks. And lastly, the wanting of any stop or space between the words, besides all uh, the de besides at the Decalogue, all these did hurt my eyes very much, and I were only enabled to read it all of cause with many suggestions at a study of full four weeks. So he says, all of these factors mm. made it very, very straining on my eyes. The, the manuscript in many places is very, very black. It's hard to read. Um, you know, the letters are all together. There's no breaks between words. And, and there's just mm. all of these factors that make it tough to read. So one of the things that he does he, de he decides he's got to figure out a way to make the letters more visible. <clears throat> and so he concocts mm -hmm. this mixture, and we know what he used because of Miriam Harry, uh, but basically here's what he says. The method I did employ to read the letters was in the beginning to make wet a few words with water, in which case I could disti distinctly see the forms of the letters through the luster of the water. But this was... Only the case for a moment, soon the leather became wet, the luster went away, and I could see nothing more. I had to wait a long time to try the method again after all were again dry, and I was afraid of spoiling the manuscript. He said he tried it again with spirit, with alcohol, which helped me but a few moments to read a few letters and transcribe while the luster lasted. So he goes, he repeats this over and over. Go ahead. While the luster lasted, how, how do you understand that, by the way? Because it sounds like to me uh, he applies it to the dry manuscript and then suddenly the uh, the letters become a little yep. more vibrant. But then as it sounds like as the liquid soaks into the leather, then it darkens again and it becomes impossible. And he has yep. to wait until it dries to to repeat the process. That's right. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. And then if that is... If that's the case, then that's why he's using alcohol because alcohol dries faster and he can repeat and it, the and it evaporates. Yeah. Um, so what he but he he describes yeah. a situation okay. where he uses we know this from other accounts he uses a camel hair brush and he dips it into uh, alcohol mm -hmm. spirits and he brushes it across the the line of letters and as as it's wet and begins to dry and you hold it like this, Jonah, you. You've got the the light coming in from the window, and you're just bare, and you go, oh, Aleph, uh, Sheen, Reish. And it's written, by the way, scriptio continua, right. no breaks. So he's, he, he's yeah. not transcribed. He's just writing letter after letter after letter. And then he takes time later to say, oh, this says, these are the words which Moses spoke, you see. So he, he he's working it, as, and it takes time. 
takes he spends four weeks on this. And it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, applying uh, alcohol to to a document like this, and one would think, my goodness, he's going to do damage to the document. This is this is going to perhaps even erase the ink, but. Uh, I suppose because of the method that he's using and the ink is not disappearing, that he, how does he refer to the ink cross? Well, you know, it's interesting. That is, uh, here's what he says about the ink. He says that it's virtually indestroyable, which is a, a made-up word. It's indestructible. Mm. But one of the things, if mm. uh, some of our viewers may have watched the video with uh, uh, when I interviewed with Nehemia. And one of the things that he mm. said was, oh, that, there you go. That's right there. That's proof that it's a forgery. Uh, and I said, well, how so? And, and he gave his reasons, and he talked about iron gall ink and what we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And, and he just, he really, people automatically are looking for a reason to say, no, it's fake. That's my clue right there. That's my. And I said, well, wait a minute. And we had this conversation. Ultimately, what he said is there are ancient inks which might fit this description, but I don't know. Well, what I want to say is let's let's just write it down as a clue. We don't know yet what the mm. ink is made of, but if we were to find, mm -hmm. Jono, hear this, if we were to find one of these strips associated with Shapira, one of these ancient strips, and then could test the ink, like really test the ink, then mm. there are tools in place now that we could determine is the ink something we would expect to find in antiquity and so forth. Sure. So anyway, but mm -hmm. but he did notice that. He did make a point of talking about the ink. But a couple of things that he does as he's producing this transcription, he says um, uh, he wet it again until he had transcribed the most into Hebrew letters. So he's using modern Hebrew letters. He's not writing, so he sees an ancient paleo olive. He writes more of a script olive, like we would use in modern Hebrew. And then he's trying to read them, and he's comparing what he has written, the transcription of this ancient manuscript, uh, in his eyes, to the Masoretic text. And he's noting, he says, our usual Bible, that's what he calls it, and found mm. very interesting variations, and then he begins to talk about those. And, and yep, and there are variations in uh, uh, letter form, three letters, if yep. I remember correctly. Can you tell us uh, what we know about that? And, and has there been any light in Phoenician studies uh, as to these letter forms that we can speak about now? We, we have two charts of the letter. Uh, we have two actual charts of the letters that were found on these manuscript strips. Now, remember, we'll talk about this, and especially as we get into the series, but we know that there are at least mm. two different hands. There are at least two copies of what we think are almost essentially exactly the same manuscript. So, uh, again, of the 42 columns of text, 16 leather strips, we, we basically, what we really have are two full manuscripts with 21 columns each. So you roughly, you know, if you, we'll, we'll talk about the details of that. But here, here's the thing. Uh, he's going to tell us in this letter to Strzok that he has uh, these two manuscripts and part of a third even, uh, a small, small piece of a third. So fascinating. Now, one of the questions you, you should be asking is, if this is a forgery and you're trying to trick the learned world, you're going to be very fortunate to, uh, don't overdo it. Don't play your cards too hard. If you're going to make a whole manuscript, mm. just make one. Don't make two. And if you're going to make two, make sure they're exact. You can't, I mean, there are even mm. small details that are different between the two. Like you're, you're telling me, and Shapira notices some of these, and some uh, he doesn't. Again, there are just too many details. Now, so the two, uh, we have two copies of the alphabet, the letter forms. Guta, which we'll talk about particularly in the next discussion we have, uh, the German scholar Hermann mm. Guta makes a chart of the letter forms, and he puts it in his book, uh, The Fragments of a Leather Manuscript, 
uh, containing Moses' last words. Yeah, which you and Dave. Israel. That's right. Made that, available. And and by the way, uh, that's this Kindle version yeah, is now Kindle available. Yeah, Kindle right? and paperback. And, yeah. and in the back of that book, yeah. we included the photograph, a photograph of Guta's actual chart of the paleo letters. This is so fun. I want people mm. to really get good at paleo, and, and especially this alphabet. Now, the other, the other alphabet chart was produced by Ginsburg, and it's in a, uh, a manuscript in the British Library. Right now, we have copies of this, and, and he includes a chart of the paleo letters, too. The other way... Of, of the paleo letters that are right. in the Moses that's scroll. Right. Um, uh, and and I, I suppose that Schroeder, in his book, uh, obviously has um, uh, paleo alphabets he that does. Uh, can be referred to and compared to... Now, remember, to, remember yeah, okay, Schroeder's book is published in 1869. So 69. He, what he's dealing yeah. with is lapidary, inscriptions, you know, like engraved in stone and coins and right. things of that nature, uh, yeah. but not a, a leather manuscript. That's not, that's unheard of. It's mm. that no one's ever seen anything like this. Now, you mentioned the letters that are different. Of the letter forms, everyone yeah. says almost the same thing. Here's what, this is a blanket statement said by everyone who is in the know in ancient scripts at the time. And this is paraphrased because they vary slightly, but they say, you know, it looks a whole awful lot like what we see on the Meshistella. The alphabet, the letter forms are almost precisely what we see on the um, on the Meshistone. But here's the truth. That's not true. You, there are three letters that are different and substantially so. One is the Zion. One is the Kaf. And remember, in modern Hebrew, you have a medial form of Kaf, which looks like a backward C, and then mm -hmm. the elongated used at the end of a word. There is none of that. Uh, right. It's a singular form, as you would expect in Paleo, but it doesn't look anything really like um, the modern Hebrew or the Paleo Hebrew. In fact, the Paleo Hebrew that mm -hmm. people were accustomed to uh, had almost like, uh, I know this isn't the best example, kind of like a chicken foot. It has three, uh, three uh, oh, yeah. prongs and then a, sh a shaft. Mm -hmm. And this one is mm -hmm. more almost like the, the number seven, like you would draw a number seven. Now, right. one letter, so it's one unique. letter that yeah. is also unique is the letter tet. The letter Tet, it's, this is yeah. something that has really caused me to do some deep research here. The letter Tet in the Shapira manuscript is different than anything we've mm. seen. And, and here's not so, so different, but different enough. But here's one thing that's mm. interesting, and it's caused some people to raise their eyebrows. The Tet is not used at all on the Mesha stone, the Moabite stella, and it's missing entirely mm. from the Siloam inscription. So some have alleged, mm. and I'm, this is total transparency here, some have alleged that a forger in 1878, and particularly 1883, would have been at a loss for how to make a tet. This is their claim, because you don't have one in the Mesha. But what, there what, are... Tets to choose from. You, you, we have tets. Yeah, right, right. Well, that, that was going to yeah. be my question. So, does Schroeder? We, we do. Have, he we does. Do. Okay. So, but this is this is right. unique. This is different. In fact, here is what Shapira says about the letter forms. Right. He goes. This mm. is his letter to Strzok. He says the letters are of the oldest form, nearly the same as those of the Mesha stone. He says only mm. less ancient. He believes they're less ancient. Okay, why is that? He said, as it mm. seemed to me. The only difference are the Zion and Kaf. The Zion are instead, he shows this versus this, uh, and the Kaf, this as in this. The Tet, which are not to be found, neither in the Mesha nor Siloam inscription, are here. And it's about mm. like this. And he draws it in his letter. And he says, I couldn't make it exact. So I have, and I've examined the tet, 
the drawing of the tet in uh, Guta's book on the chart. I've looked at it in uh, the chart, which is drawn by Ginsberg, which is in the British Library. And mm-hmm. I've also corresponded with Matthew Rochelle, uh, a great scholar and a, a, an expert in paleography here. It, because this has me puzzled, mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm still hoping... And I kind of think we're going to ultimately find an example of this, and it's going to be proven to be ancient because too many other things uh, mm. prove to me that it is ancient. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, Shapira knows ancient writing. <clears throat> he knows old writing in particular, and he knows about scribes. And one of the things that he says is that it appears that whoever wrote these manuscripts are pretty good at it. Um, he says, mm-hmm. the writing itself seems to have been done by a steady and running hand as if the man having written a good deal Phoenician in his lifetime. He said, I noticed some stiffness to be remarked in the writing of the Decalogue, but this may have been caused by a scribe being forced to stop after every word and make a point, counter to his accustomed way of running on from one end to the other. Uh, and so he he gives he gives Strock as much information as he can to inform him about the manuscript that he now has, because remember mm. we're not done yet. But he is coming to Europe, and he wants to give Strock a heads up because he wants Strock mm. to look at this manuscript when he arrives. So he's given him as much detail as he can. Now, he knows that Strzok is going to have a question. And the question is this, why are you just now telling me about this? Mm. And so on page four, he says, you, now, you're going to ask why I've been quiet about it until now. And he says, here's the reason. And he tells him the story Mm. of sending a note to Schlotman. Now, I think that this is an invitation I don't know this. This is my speculation. I believe that when Strzok sees this, he can't telephone. It's before the telephone, but he gets up with Schlopman and he says, hey, Shapira says that he wrote you in 1878 about a manuscript, and he's bringing that here. He's convinced it's authentic, and I think Schlopman blew his top. And and probably, one more point, and probably because of his response from Schlopman, Strzok goes back to his office, pins a letter, dates it May 27th, sends it to Shapir and says, don't even bother to bring that obvious forgery. This is almost the exact language that Schlotman had used in his rebuke, and I think that's what inspired mm-hmm. that. So let me just read this from, from your book because uh, this is interesting. Um, now you'll ask why I had Shapir, uh, quoting Shapir from the letter, um, uh, why have I have been quiet uh, about this until now? He admits that it was because Schlotman's angry rebuke. He wrote, quote, I confess that when I received Professor, Professor Schlotman's letter, I began to totter in my opinion. Uh, mainly, he continued, quote, for the general reason that the professor gave that it contradicts our right. Bible. He informed Strzok that uh, this caused him to become um, irresolute and that he pondered the possibility that Schlopman might be right in his assessment of the scroll as being a forgery. But why? Uh, because it differs. See, it's it's a really interesting thing because it seems like they are leaning towards the safety of, of their fundamentalist view, if you like, or the, the safety of their, their confirmation bias. Don't give me something right. that's different. We're not even going to entertain the idea yep. of that. Put it away, you that's heretic. That's right. Okay. Um, and uh, so, so, but my... Uh, and I, I appreciate you sharing the reason why you think uh, th- that he may have, you know, taken this to Schlotman and Schlotman blew it yep. up and then Strzok writes back immediately and goes, how dare you? But, but then what about the other possibility of uh, perhaps Shapira preempting the possibility that Strzok and Schlotman have already uh, spoken about this topic and perhaps here uh, Shapira is doing a little bit of damage Could be. control. Could, no, you know, that's I think a great he, point. You probably heard Schlotman talk about this 
maybe he's mentioned yeah. this to you and he's written me off. Let me just tell you, you know, I I too felt, yep. you know, the, the the danger of presenting such a, a thing. I put it away for so many years, but um, but yep. now, you know, maybe yep. okay. So that's a yep, possibility. That's right. As well. And so right. what happens is um, he, you know, he he could be preempting this what could be an ultimate conversation. And and again, he's he's been burned. Shapiro's been burned by these gossips uh, that are in Germany already. Kind of, he he probably feels like they've already got their mind made up. But see, Shapiro's mind is made up too. So one of the things he does is he must be looking at. I think he's looking at the letter from Schlotman to him, dated October of 1878. By the way. I did not have that letter mm. when I wrote the Moses Scroll. We have it now. Edan uh, mm. Dershowitz found that letter in Israel in a museum, mm. and uh, and so we have copies in Germany of the handwritten letter. So, but we knew because of Shapira's letter to Strock some of the objections, and and then you know we go into a lot of detail, which I don't want to necessarily go into all the details, but uh, unless you have something very specific. One of the things that is noteworthy here is that Shapira says Schlopman called the thing a forgery for the following reasons, and he gave some of them. And he says, now let me mm -hmm. tell you, I realized that I made a mistake in my transcription. Meaning, he said, now going back, I see why Schlopman would have thought that this was not authentic based on this, but I misread Here's what it actually says, and I'm, you know, so he's clearing the air there. But one of the things that he says is that all the objections that Schlotman puts forward, none of those really had any real substance to him. Hold on. What really got him, hmm. what caused him to put the manuscript away was the rebuke saying that it contradicted the Bible. Hmm. Listen to this. He said, I confess, sort of what you just read, this is from the letter itself, that when getting Professor S. letters, Schlotman, I began to totter in my opinion, not so much for the last mm. reasons as for the general reason the professor gives, that it contradicts our Bible. And, and then he goes into, he says, now, so... Because he, you know, he, he's a believer in the Bible. He wants to be uh, mm. a good Bible believing man. Uh, and now, but he's had mm. his faith challenged by reading Bleak, obviously, and some of the academic views of the Hebrew Bible. So he can no longer hide under that fundamentalist cloak. But at the time, he could. Mm. You know, he could say, well, you know, they're right. I mean, this contradicts our Bible. And, and he was shamed into putting it up. But once he becomes convinced that the Hebrew Bible, now listen, audience, don't, don't get nervous, but Shapiro realized that the Hebrew Bible was not the inspired, inerrant, authoritative word of God. He realized that it had uh, inconsistencies and variations between text to text. So now, now what does he do? He says... But if it's a forgery, he gets into this question. He said, who in the world could have done it? And for what reason? And for yeah, what, what purpose? The, you know, mm. he says, because remember, Shapira buys this manuscript a piece at a time, and he's not like giving tons of money for it. So... No, he's, well, he says, uh, the money that I paid for the manuscript was not worth speaking right. of. So it's a pittance. So for, for, for what reason would... Uh, uh, somebody forge a document like this, and if someone was so knowledgeable uh, as to produce something like this, they would surely know the worth of a document if it was considered to uh -huh. be authentic. Um, it's they're not going to allow it to be sold for cents. Right. Listen, know? one one okay. one more point to kind of underline what I said a moment ago. Uh, this is the way he sort of wraps this part up. He said uh, why he put the book away, the the manuscript away. He says, nevertheless, mm. <clears throat> the strong reverence I always had for our Bible, which did not agree with the narrative of our manuscript strips, made still the manuscript somewhat doubtful in my eyes. And that was the reason I did not publish anything about it till now. 
Then he gets into, Jono, what we've covered in a previous uh, discussion. He Mm. says, a short time ago, a book called Einleitung in das Alte Testament von Friedrich Bleek in Berlin, 1860, came into my hands, and what a change came over my mind. After studying the above book, I see now that the most of the variations between our manuscript and the Bible are of such a character as are already used by many eminent scholars as a proof that our Deuteronomy was not written by Moses or about his time. Get this, Jono. All such passages are not to be found in our manuscript. Now, what he begins Mm -hmm. to realize... You know, he said, yeah, I was a good soldier. I put it away. I put the book away because of my reverence for the Bible. But he said, then he he reads this book by Bleak, and he says, what a change comes over my mind. And then he says, let me tell you, let me tell you, the scholars have found inconsistencies and variations in the biblical text. And he said, and I'm exaggerating for effect, but he said, hallelujah, the manuscript strips I have lack all of those problem passages. And here are some examples. Uh He says, in our Bible, we see uh, phrases such as, ad hayom hazeh, until this day or that day. He says that that's not in our our manuscript strips. Why is Uh that a proof to Shapira? Because that language is anachronistic. It's not, you wouldn't say, and this was the case until this day, if you're writing about something that happened later, because that's not something a contemporary writer would put. Uh, you know, and so mm-hmm. he says that none of those cases are there. The other thing that he really focuses on here, and I love this, it, I think it's, we'll get into this in another discussion if you're okay, just touching it and leaving it is that he says the geography, the reason I want to leave it, I know you're working on some of this, the geography in Deuteronomy is problematic. The route of the Israelites is problematic. In this manuscript, he puts it like this. He says, the order of the last journeys and battles, meaning of Israel, are in the best order. In other words, better than... Uh, what we find in the Hebrew Mm. Bible. Now, by the way, I have another quote which confirms this, besides the fact that I know what was written in the manuscript. Claude Condor, when Mm. he and Besant were whispering about the manuscript outside the room where Shapir is showing it to the scholars, Claude Condor says, you know, it is interesting that all of the journeys of the Israelites are in the right order. In other words, this is a problem in Deuteronomy, that doesn't exist in our manuscript. So, so this is fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he gets into some of, and I can go through this, you just jump in when you want, but he starts talking about the spelling. We call this the orthography of the manuscript. And what he says mm-hmm. is, he says it's defective, deficient, meaning we, in, in modern Hebrew, even in the, by the time the Dead Sea Scrolls come around, uh, certain consonants begin to be used as vowel letters. Uh, Latin phrases, uh, matrix lectionis, it's the mothers of reading. Certain consonants become uh, double valued as vowels. Like in the English, we use mm-hmm. Y sometimes in the name Kelly. Uh, it's a vowel there, but yellow is a letter Y and it's used as a consonant. So we see this. Sure. But what he says, The writing is always deficient, basically. Uh, The yod and the vav, beside when it's served as a pronoun, like in in a word, if you use on uh, the end of the word, use a yod or a vav, it means my or his. And he says, that's still there. You see that. But internal vowels, Mm. medial vowel letters, you pretty much don't see that. And he gives examples where there might be some exceptions. But he begins to think, and other people quite capable in Hebrew have asked the question, Guta really gets into this. We'll talk more about Guta later. 
he he begins talking about diphthongs and 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 at what point do the Hebrew vowel letters come in? What what do we know? It, it, it could this be this manuscript represents some crossing stage from not using internal vowels at all to using them sometimes and so this is one of the things that he gets into uh, and then he gets into the order of the commandments uh the 10 words uh and he uh, again I want to do special discussions on the content of the scroll so if something is burning in your your mind or whatever you want to jump in with please do but otherwise he he mentions uh, he mentions the 10 words he mentions the uh the 10 comments being from God and and how this manuscript focuses only on those comments as he calls them uh he talks about the blessings mm-hmm. and the curses then he has this interesting question he says i, I just don't know One thing that strikes me, other than in the opening line and the closing line, the name Jehovah is not used. He says, this puzzles me. Mm. He said, that might be from a later scribe, but maybe the document is an Elois document. Now, remember, he didn't know what an Elois document was when he first came to possess this manuscript. But what he discovers Mm. upon reading Bleak in the academics is that there is evidence, at least in terms of academic uh, trying academics trying to figure out the the, the writing, how the, we came to possess what we now possess. Uh, he suggests mm-hmm. that maybe this document is an Elois document, and here's the way he puts it. Uh, he says, um, "Should we be allowed to say that the manuscript belongs to Jews?" who dwelt in the east of Jordan, where the manuscript was supposed to have been found, and that they believed only in Elohim, although the Western Jews must have long before known and used the word, and he uses the Hebrew here, yod heh vav and that may account for the exactness mm-hmm. of the topography. Uh, and, and then he says, you know, in other words, if this manuscript has an origin, Transjordan, east of the Jordan, maybe... East of the Jordan, when this is written, they didn't know the name Jehovah. Could that? He's just he's trying to figure out why the manuscript is in Elois. Yeah, the, the, and it seems um, uh, highly speculative. There, I don't know that. He, I, I think he's just truly just speculating. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting, but it doesn't seem like he's saying. Uh, could it be that that the whole mosaic narrative uh, originated? As an Eloah's document, do you think that's what he's saying? He does propose that in another document. He he thinks that it may have originally been ah, okay. what we would call an Eloah's document, and then that a later scribe penned, mm. uh, you know, updated it and said, "Well, now we call Elohim Jehovah." Now you might say, "Well, I don't think mm. that's possible." Mm. Well, you need to read Exodus chapter six, verse one and two, because in Exodus chapter six, according sure. to that narrative. The name Jehovah wasn't known at one point, uh, and this is God speaking in Exodus mm. 6 2, according to the narrative, uh, but he was known in forms of the name El, right? So, so mm. he he's puzzled by this. We'll talk more uh, detailed about that later. What he what he begins to say, he he sort of begins to wrap up his letter by saying, so and I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing, he goes, you know, as I close, you might ask me, how old is this manuscript? And he says, I yeah. will say, judging from the form of letters, one would be inclined to give to this unorthodoxical manuscript, I love his made-up word there, unorthodoxical manuscript, such an early time as between the date of the Mesha stone and the Siloam inscription or about the 6th century B.C. This is his date. Now, if you remember in the Moses Scroll, Mm. I put it, uh, for what it's worth, I put it in the time of Josiah, this end of the second, uh, end of the the first temple period. But he goes, but one must be very cautious. See, he's not just selling this as authentic. He wants the scholar to look at it. He goes, you have to be very cautious. Mm. Who knows? 
May it not be that they used old forms of letters in writing, copying such documents, and especially for using them as a talisman for the dead bodies or as charms, only with very old forms of letters, even if such letters are commonly not used at all anymore. Now, it's interesting. We now know, particularly in the Hashmonean period, that there was a revival of using paleo. What Shapira is suggesting, I might add, to some degree ahead of his time, that, that this could be later, much later in history than he thinks it might be, but they're archaizing. In other words, if somebody, when uh, paleo is no longer used, the writer of this manuscript is using it to uh, present it as ancient, right? You, you see, mm -hmm. he's, he's open to all these possibilities. Sure. But he says sure. this I love. He goes, the question, and I'm leaving this to our audience. I'm not finished yet, but he, he says, the question will of course be for scholars to decide if agreed to my suggestion. Mm. How late we may put a Jewish colony of unorthodoxical doctrines as of the ten tribes or the Rechabites or etc. before or after the time of, of Christ. I will mm -hmm. only add that I have not compared the two manuscripts only partly, not all, as it hurts my eyes very much. I will affix mm. a transcription of most of the manuscript in Hebrew, and I will put here and there a remark. You will, dear professor, be better able to find faults and virtues of it than I. I'll also ask pardon for my daring suggestions and ask to give me your candid opinion about it should you or your friends find it so interesting as I flatter myself it to be. You may send me a telegram with a few words upon my expenses. I think to go soon, in a few days, for a short time, to examine some manuscripts, if possible, uh, in, in Egypt, and then, GW, God willing, very soon to Berlin with my manuscript. Excuse my very bad writing, done in mm -hmm. haste. Allow me to remain yours truly, an obedient servant, M.W. Shapira. Then he puts the NB, note bene. Uh, uh, Schroeder is here. And I'm ready to make a big reveal here, Jono, if you're ready. If you got questions, jump in now. I want to tell people Go. something. Well, all, all I was going to say, and I think this is probably where you're going now, you made mention of a, um, a, a transcription that he made available of some of the, of the text. <laughs> do we have that transcription? No one off? knew we did, but I think we do. And let me tell you how I think we do. Uh, it wasn't my discovery. What I did was put some clues together. After I published the Moses Scroll in March of uh, 2021, a New York Times article appears, the work of a Harvard mm -hmm. fellow by the name of Edan Dershowitz. Edan Dershowitz published a book we've talked about quite frequently on this show. Uh, mm -hmm. It's known as The Valediction of Moses, a proto-biblical book. And one of the big reveals mm -hmm. in, in his work is he said, I have found a transcription. The transcription, Jono, is in a bundled up manuscript called MS, period, OR, period, FOL, standing for folio, period, 1342. It's a, it's a manuscript that is in the Staatsbibliothek in Berlin. And what what uh, Edan Dershowitz discovered, and he talks about it, it makes up chapter two of his book. He calls it A New Discovery, the Shapira Papers. What happened is, what we think, ha what he thought happened, and then I'll tell my side, he says that when Shapira dies, his widow takes papers on his desk, like, God forbid I ever mm -hmm. die. But, you know, Bridget would come in, and she takes all these papers, and she goes, I don't know what to do with all this. Seth, go give this to the library in Israel or whatever. Just get them out of here. And, and that's what happens. So the widow, Shapira, stacks up papers, supposedly, and she brings them to Strzok. Now, she knows mm -hmm. that everybody in the world knows. Strzok is a famous scholar, and she knows that her husband knows Strzok. And so 
She gives this bundle of papers to Strzok. Strzok evidently bundles them up and gives them to Morris Steinschneider, another scholar. Keep all these names straight. Mm-hmm. We're going to have a test at the end of this. And Steinschneider has them bound up in a book. It's available online. Interesting story. Right before mm-hmm. I publish my book, I get an email from Daniel M. Wright. Everybody knows Daniel. Daniel's my dear mm-hmm. friend. He says, hey, Ross, look, I found this. It's a handwritten, it's, it's a list of manuscripts. In fact, the German title is, translated, Autograph List of the Hebrew Manuscripts Collected by Shapira. And it's a list. It's just page after page. He says, uh, manuscript 123, it's a uh, document on the Psalms found in Yemen, blah, 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 blah. Manuscript number 27, and they're in order. Well, scattered in that... So I get this from Daniel, and I said, Daniel, this is great, but the book's coming out. He said, I just thought you would like it. I said, I love it, thank you, and I put it away. Turns out that in that manuscript are three purple ink pages that I didn't notice. Mm -hmm. And and I wouldn't have noticed unless, because they're not in order. They're three pages, they're numbered, one, two, three, but they're arranged in the book, three, two, one, but they're not in order, and there are many, many pages. They're just shuffled through the other papers, ultimately bound up. Idan is a superb mm-hmm. Hebrew scholar. He's reading through probably every line of this book, and he says, <gasps> he finds one, and it's it's the manuscript. We know the text of the manuscript because when I published the Moses Scroll, I had Guta and Meyer's transcription, and I had Ginsburg's transcription. Mm-hmm. So we know this text. Yeah. So did Idan Dershowitz. Idan Dershowitz reads, Hel ele hadevarim asher diber Moshe al pi. Oh, he goes, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. This is the Shapira manuscript. Yeah. So he publishes this. Now, one day, not too, too long ago, I'm getting ready to write a blog post and I'm reading, oh, I was publishing the letter from Shapira to Strzok. And I read this Mm -hmm. this line, Jono. Now, I had transcribed it wrongly. I had, I will once a transcription of most of the manuscript. That didn't even make sense. But I went back and looked at that again, and it literally says, I will affix, affix, A-F-I-X, a transcription of most of the manuscript in Hebrew, and I'll put here and there a remark. He's sending a letter Mm -hmm. to Strzok. He puts in it, I believe, three purple pages that have most of the manuscript, and he writes comments on it. So I immediately Mm. send this to Idan and Tabor and uh, um, Matthew because we're working on this at that time, this very question about these purple Mm. pages. This is, I don't even remember when this was. And and so they all give their reasons why. Maybe, maybe it's not. No one said, absolutely, you're right, but it meets all the criteria. In other words, some hmm. of the um, mistakes that are brought up by Schlotman uh, are found in this manuscript. So we know this is an early transcription and not later. We know that later he discovers uh, some different readings. Bottom line is, mm-hmm. I think that the purple pages that were... Fa- so why do I think that? Here's another proof. They're just shoved in. It was it was something that was in possession of Strzok that ultimately gets bound mm-hmm. up. Strzok would have that letter yep. with the transcription that's promised in the letter. So if my point to the other investigators is... If this isn't the transcription that Shapira sent to Strzok, we need to go back and look at Strzok's papers because there's another transcription that would be in Strzok's stuff. Now, one one yeah, final point. Wouldn't that be great? If one we had one a... final point is this. Yeah. My question to this day, we talked a lot about a letter from Shapira to Herman Strzok. How is it that that letter to the German Professor Hermann Strzok, Berlin professor, how does that end up in a dossier 
that Ginsburg's wife gave to the British Library after he died. How is it that Ginsburg, the Brit, that is so I'm, curious. I'm real curious. Yeah. What is going on? So what? It just we can't leave that there. What's your opinion? You must have a leading opinion in your mind. I mean, we can't prove anything, but I, what do you I think? I tell you, Ginsburg so wanted this manuscript. He he really really wanted it. And of course, most people who study this would say, yeah, but he he said it was a fake. Yeah, he did, but. There are other indications that make me wonder. Like he, you know, it's like my precious. He's so in, just drawn to this manuscript. Right. He can't let it go. He, he, I wonder. Mm. In fact, I wonder. You know, we actually know where the manuscript went after Shapira died. But, mm -hmm. but Shapira was at that auction. We know he was at that auction. I think he is, it's such a big deal to him he begins um, to Ginsburg. Ginsburg yeah, Ginsburg sorry. was at the auction. Yeah, Ginsburg, and he yeah. collects things, right. and mm. as you can see, what made it into this dossier A D D M S four one two nine four. He he is just mm. really really into this manuscript. So, mm. the letter to Strzok covers some of Shapira's views on the manuscript, and he is going. To see Strzok. Now, remember, Strzok wrote him a letter May 27th and said, don't you bother coming here with that obvious forgery. But he does show up. He shows mm. up at Strzok's uh, office. Yeah, he knocks on the door. Strzok uh, tells him, I, I, I don't have, Shapira, my eyes are bothering me. I, I've got problems with my eyes. I don't have, he, he, he doesn't even look at it. Get that out of here. Go give it to somebody else. And so mm. Shapira tells the story. He says, look, uh, Strzok says he's got bad eyes. He, he can't look at it. And so he then decides, I'm already in Germany. I've got to take this manuscript to someone else here, a scholar in Germany. And who does he go to? Mm -hmm. He goes to Hermann Goethe, who he knows Goethe trusts. Uh, Guta and Shapira worked together on the on the Siloam inscription, and and they spent many many hours together talking about the then not yet deciphered Siloam inscription, and he, and Shapira would sometimes go meet him in the city of David, and sometimes uh, Guta would go to his shop and look at his manuscript collection. Yep. They're buddies, so he goes to Leipzig, and and that's what we're going to pick up with, but. But I've got – I'm open for questions. That's what we're going to pick yeah. up next week. Well, well, yeah, but I was just going to say uh, how opportune then for Guter and Meyer that Strzok uh, refused to look at it. It is interesting that uh, in the reply to Shapira that Shapira didn't receive, he'd already let – well, that's interesting in and of yeah. itself, isn't it? He was so emboldened that he, he clearly thought, I'm going to write this letter by way of introduction to Strzok and then I'm going to follow up by, by showing him the document. He, he – he didn't even seem to think that it was possible that Strzok would have said, I'm yeah. not interested. And yet that is the uh, the reply that we got uh, uh, that he sends almost immediately that it's not worth his while to bring, quote, such a, an evident forgery right. to Europe. And yet when he gets there, Strzok's uh, reason for not looking at it is, ah, my eyes and I'm yeah. busy and go away. Uh, and and as I mentioned, quite opportune for <clears throat> Kutra and Maya. It makes me wonder if Kutra and Maya would have had the opportunity to view this uh, document had struck. You know, it's, it's it. no different than today, Jonah. When when someone is behind a keyboard or or writing a letter, as the case would be in in 1883, it's a whole lot easier to be tough and strong. And don't you even bring that forgery here. Well, when Shapira shows up at his office, he's like, "Hello, my brother. Look what I have." <laughs> like, and he's what? like, "Oh no!" <laughs> you know, he he loses his courage. It happens so often among men today. Mm. They, they lose their courage, and they, you know, it's easy to send an email or put something on a Facebook uh, or, or a Twitter or even on, you know, a YouTube mm. comment. But, but when, when it comes, comes to, to face to face, to face yeah. oh, well, my eyes are bothering me. I can't look at it. Bring it to someone uh. else. It's funny, it's funny too, isn't it? Because he's got the letter waiting for him. He knows he's got the letter waiting for him upon his return. Should he ever had returned, uh, he would have read this. But uh, bad luck for, for Strzok. Right. 
And uh, yeah, so that's where we're going to pick up um, Herman Guter and uh, Ed Meyer uh, next week in Leipzig. Um, and that's going to be just for those who are following along. Uh, yeah, chapter five is that's where right. we are about to that's be. Right. My goodness. Well, that was that was uh, exhausting on that topic. That's great uh, and fascinating too. Uh, there's a lot of stuff there that you mentioned that I didn't know, so that was really good. Um, but uh, we're going to go over to the. Uh, we're we're we going to go. We're, we're going to talk to. We're going to talk to the Yakut. In fact, I'm I'm excited to see uh, Dave Tyler is is with us. And once we once Hi, we Dave. break off, James. Uh, G'day, James. You, you've got James in there as well. Or, or he was there. Yeah. James yeah, okay. So we're going to uh, break over. We're going to go to have this discussion. And Dave has been to the Stotts Bibliotheque on several occasions. Uh, oh, and, yeah. and he's he's actually sharing pictures now. So we're going to talk to Dave. We're going to talk about some of the trips and talk about more uh, Morris Stein Snyder and all of that. It's going to be some good stuff. Uh, and if people would like to join the Yachad, you can do so just by clicking right. join there under the video. Uh, do that, follow the links, and uh, and we would love to spend time with you one-on-one uh, with a bit of Q&A after these programs. Um, that is it for from us. We're going to be back this time next week don't to miss continue in, in Chapter 5. Don't forget, don't miss it. Don't forget, we, we do have the um, the UI conference in, in April. There's still room right. available. Uh, you can register. We prefer that you do register. It's free to join uh, the conference, but we just want to know that you're coming, uh, and you can uh, link That's the description. Right. Uh, or in the comments there. All right, we're on our way. Thanks, thank you, Jono.